and get started. Uh, I just wanted, my name's Steve DeWitt. I'm with the Association for Career and Technical Education. And we're gonna start off with Senator Kane, uh, who has been a tremendous advocate and a co-chair of the CTE caucus here in the Senate. So Senator Kane. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for coming. You're, you're in for a treat today. You are in for a treat. Um, this is a, a panel discussion to educate us all about best practices in, in workforce training and career and technical education opportunities. And the three co-chairs of this CTE caucus, Senator Baldwin, Senator Portman, and me have each asked uh, a star from our own states to come and present uh, what they're doing in the workforce area. And I'm, uh, I'm not here to do all the introductions, but I want to specifically thank Danny from Huntington Ingalls, the apprenticeship program at the shipyard that builds America's aircraft carriers, maintains those aircraft carriers, and uh, nuclear subs. Uh, it was the largest private employer uh, in Virginia, and they have a superb apprenticeship program that you're going to hear about today. Uh, just a word about the CTE caucus. Many of you have come to earlier educational sessions uh, that we've done, uh, and I'm going to say just a word about it before I duck back into uh, we're in an armed services hearing on the ISIL threat right now. But um, Senators Portman, Baldwin, and I all believe that in the spectrum of educational offerings that are important in this country, career and technical education is really important, but often underemphasized. Um, it's been underemphasized in the K-12 space. It's been um, underemphasized in the community college space. It's underemphasized in other areas of federal policy. Just to give you a, a couple of examples, in the, uh, in the uh, higher ed space, um, we find again and again uh, in Virginia, for example, our community colleges receive funding based on the students who are there to get associate degrees. But if a student is there to get a career skill or a technical skill, the community college gets no funding for people who are there just to get skills. So there's an old time funding model that doesn't really account for the value of career and technical training in the community college setting. If you're in the military today, you get a military tuition assistance benefit of up to $4,500 a year. You can use that at a community college in college. You can't use it at a high quality technical program under current DOD rules. So there's a series of obstacles in the way um, that, uh, that I think block the recognition of the value of high quality career and technical education programs. And so the reason for the formation of the caucus was to systematically try to route out any obstacles eliminate any sense that career and technical education was in any way kind of a second class kind of education. But also, it's more than just routing out obstacles. It's also about shining a spotlight on best practices and doing affirmative policy to raise the profile of CTE. Uh, this matters a lot to me for a couple of reasons. Personally, as I've shared with some of you before, my dad ran an iron worker and uh, iron worker organized uh, iron working shop in the stockyard of uh, stockyards of Kansas City. My brothers and I and my mother all worked in that business growing up. And I saw the artistry of trained iron workers and welders and the fact that you could make a great living in trades like that. Uh, in Honduras in 1980 and 81, I ran a school that taught kids to be welders and carpenters and again learned in that way that power of career and technical education. And as governor, I had the chance to work with the shipyard in the expansion of the apprenticeship program. They have just moved into a new facility. This is a, a program that's nearly 100 years old, but they moved into a, a brand new facility that is spectacular, that's carrying forward and training the next generation of American shipbuilders. So CTE, I think, is a, is a uh, uh, it's, not, it's nothing new, it's been around for a long time, but I think there's a renaissance and awareness of CTE, and that's what we're trying to accomplish with the formation of the caucus. And uh, appreciate everybody being here today because we'll make better policy, especially if we understand what are some of the star programs that exist. And, and they're each different, and they each fit in differently into a, into a state system. The state systems are different, but you're gonna hear some good best practice examples today from folks from three states and also from the DOE. Um, and with that, what I'm going to do is, again, Danny, thank you especially for coming up here because I, I just don't think there's a better example of, of CTE that I've ever seen than what you guys do at the shipyard. And again, it may have been around for a while, but you're keeping it new, keeping it interesting, and I, you'll, I know you'll describe that today. And with that, I'm going to duck back into armed services but turn it over to my colleague and somebody I'm proud is the co-chair of the CTE caucus, Senator Baldwin from Wisconsin. Good morning. What's left of it? 
It's great to be here. I want to just say a few brief words, because I know you're all here to hear from our panel, and not necessarily from the co-chairs. But I, I have to start with um, uh, welcoming all of you to the third briefing that the Senate Career and Technical Education Caucus is hosting. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be one of the co-chairs, along with Senator Kane, Senator Enzi, and Senator Portman. I do know that um, Senator Portman uh, hopefully will be here to uh, add his greetings uh, shortly. Um, I also want to thank our great panel here today. Uh, you are um, really helping share some critical information with the Congress. Um, about how we close the skills gap and advance American business. And um, I, I am delighted that you're here. Uh, I have to brag about my home state of Wisconsin. I've heard uh, Senator Kane talking a little bit about uh, Virginia. Um, I regard Wisconsin as a leader in career and technical education. We have close to a quarter million students enrolled in uh, CTE. Uh, we offer um, CTE in comprehensive high schools, in CTE specific high schools, in technical colleges, and two-year colleges. And so I'm really delighted to have the president of one of those institutions, Brian Albrecht of Gateway Technical College, uh, join us for today's panel. Uh, Gateway serves thousands of students in Kenosha, Racine, and Walworth counties in southeastern Wisconsin. It offers dozens of CTE programs providing critical skills in a broad range of high-wage, in-demand professions. And I know um, that you will uh, learn a lot uh, through the testimony of, uh, of, of Brian Albrecht as well as our other panelists. Um, as we'll hear uh, in more detail, um, uh, Gateway's programs are short-term, uh, sorry, many of Gateway's programs are short-term, although they help students obtain industry-recognized uh, Great greetings. Good to see you, Senator Portman. Um, they help uh, students receive industry-recognized certificates or other credentials that they need to succeed. But a lot of these shorter-term courses of study are not currently eligible for federal financial aid. As a result, students may not be able to affordably access in-demand programs such as computer-aided drafting or computer numerical control. Gateway's experience, and on one of my couple of visits uh, to Gateway, inspired me to op um, introduce a bill called the CTE Opportunity Act, which makes federal student loans available to students enrolled in shorter term CTE programs that lead to a certificate or a credential that will help them succeed in a particular industry. And I'm proud to have uh, had uh, my co-chair, Senator Kane, join me as an original co-sponsor of the bill, um, and certainly uh, delighted to have the support of the ACTE and the Wisconsin Technical College System. Um, I look forward to working with many of my colleagues in the United States Senate um, to advance this legislation and other measures that help support uh, access to CTE programs at all levels. Our continued economic recovery truly depends upon sound investments in policies and uh, uh, programs uh, that promote CTE both at the secondary and post-secondary level. Uh, CTE provides uh, promise for those who are unemployed, underemployed, or looking just to improve their skills in order to obtain a higher wage job, a higher skilled job at their own uh, work setting. The business community has also been clear on the need for a highly, uh, highly trained workforce uh, for in-demand fields. Uh, career and technical education provides the knowledge and skills that our students desire and that our economy needs at this point. So again, I want to thank our great panel today uh, for your leadership in being here uh, for this briefing. And I um, am happy to turn it over to my co-chair, Rob Portman, to say a few words of welcome. Tammy, thanks, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it's terrific to have a, a nice turnout for our second uh, conference, I guess, on, on this issue of raising the awareness of uh, the importance of CTE, and in particular, uh, trying to 
energize our colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle to move forward on legislation to uh, try to improve the opportunity for more young people to get that great uh, CTE educational um, alternative. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, Senator Baldwin is part of this team. She and Senator Kane and I and Senator Enzi are kind of the uh, co-chairs and vice chairs of this caucus that we started about uh, six or nine months ago. And uh, I think it's an opportunity for us, again, not just to raise awareness, which is important, but also to ensure that we're maximizing the chance of getting some legislation passed to, to try to help out. Um, Senator Kane's coming later this morning, uh, and, and you will hear from him. Um, I just want to talk for a second about some of the folks who are here and thank them. Chuck Spielman, I see, is here. And some of you have probably worked with, with Chuck uh, over the years because he's been involved uh, nationally on this issue, but he's the superintendent of Tri-Rivers Career Center. Tri-Rivers is uh, one of our star career centers in Ohio. It's in Marion, Ohio, kind of central Ohio. And they've got a, a group there uh, within the Career Center called RAMTEC, Robotics and Advanced Manufacturing Technology Education Collaborative. It's a mouthful, therefore RAMTEC. We'll keep calling it that. Uh, but he's let me come by and visit and talk to some of the young people. And the one I was most impressed with was the 16-year-old uh, who was using robotics that is the same uh, quality of robotics equipment found down the street at a major manufacturing center. And uh, at 16 years old, you know, this kid is, is doing the kind of work that um, people in their late 20s are doing down the street and making uh, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars a year. And uh, he's pretty happy about that. And you know, looking forward to not just getting to work himself uh, using this equipment that he's become familiar with, but also uh, you know, being able to get some college credit along the way that he, he may want to use later in his career. And that's, that's the story of RamTech. It's really exciting. Our uh, industry is, is interested in it. Uh, I, I was just talking to the Arts for Metal CEO, who happens to be joining us now. And uh, you know, we're talking about the skills gap. And I said, you got to come up here and listen to what's uh, being talked about upstairs because there are people trying to address this issue. Uh, in, in Ohio, we've got about 140,000 jobs <clears throat> being advertised right now on what's called Ohio Means Jobs. You can go on and check it out online while I'm talking. Probably some people already have. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's great. We've got all these opportunities out there. But the, the, the problem is we've got probably 400,000 people out of work in Ohio today. And that's just crazy. I mean, you could take, uh, you know, 140,000 of those folks and put them to work tomorrow if they, if they had the skills. Uh, I'm not saying it's, it's all about technical skills because there are other issues involved. Uh, some of these companies who are offering some of these jobs will tell you, you know, they can't get people to pass the drug test, another issue we're working on. And, and you know, maybe in some areas there are some uh, difficulties just regionally in getting people to go to work in certain places. But primarily it's about skills. And it's that gap where we have the opportunity pretty easily to be able to help to provide people with the tools to access these jobs. So it is a, an economic issue to me. And it's about Ohio's economy, but also about our country's economy as we struggle through this you know, weak recovery. Um, you know, how, how do we actually fill these jobs that are out there? Um, I, I had a uh, town hall meeting recently, one of these teletown halls, and a guy calls in from Toledo, Ohio. And we're talking about the skills gap and so on. And he said, here's the problem. This is a tool and dime maker. He said, it's not just there's a skills gap. It's the fact that you know, the average age of the workers in our plant um, is about 50 years old. I was at a GM plant in Ohio over the uh, August recess, and the average age there is, is 49. Half the people in that plant are eligible for retirement today. And I would say the same is true at some of the steel plants in, in Ohio, that probably half the people there are eligible for retirement. And uh, so. It's going to get worse <laughs> unless we help to make it better uh, because it's not just about a gap. It's about a growing gap that will manifest itself as we aging baby boomers uh, begin to retire with more and more demand and uh, fewer people who, who have the, the skills. Um, people in this room, Senator Kane, myself, Senator Baldwin, know we can do better, Senator Enzi, and um, that's why we are promoting some of this legislation. One of the bills that uh, Senator Kane and I have introduced is about um, taking the opportunities that we've seen in our states and trying to put it into legislative language. It's called the Educating Tomorrow's Workforce Act of 2014. Um, I, I think you know, part of the way we get people's attention on this is to say, uh, yes, 
many kids do want to go to a liberal arts college and you know a four-year institution, and and that's great, but it's not for everybody. Um, and let's give people an alternative. So it's not telling kids they can't go to college. It's telling kids here's something you got to look at as an alternative. And it's also about you know getting some of those college credits while you're uh, involved in that alternative. There's a, a career center down in our area, uh, some of you know it, um, in Southwest Ohio um, called Live Oaks, and it provides uh, and has provided vocational, as it was called back uh, not too many years ago, and now career and technical ed education for several high schools in our area. And I go there for a round table discussion, and it was really interesting talking to the administrators and the teachers, and some of the corporate uh, community who are there, mostly smaller businesses that are manufacturers who are suppliers to General Electric Aircraft Engine, which is in Cincinnati. And that was great, I learned a lot. What was far more interesting to me, though, was talking to the students. And they, they brought a few students. One was currently in the program, two had just graduated this year. And both of these young men are um, 19 years old. Um, and they're pretty excited because they are, um, about to start, in both cases, they've already started now, um, jobs where they're making roughly 50,000 bucks a year, plus benefits on top of that, and they're each going to be operating uh, very sophisticated and very expensive equipment. As one of them told me, I'm gonna be operating a million dollar piece of equipment all by myself. And they also have college credit that they were able to obtain while going through this Live Oaks, Great Oaks process. And uh, so I, I think what they're looking at is Instead of four years of college and taking on, on average now, about $30,000 of debt and the costs and expense of going through that process in addition to, to the debt, um, you know, making over 200 grand a year during that process plus benefits. And so my obvious question was, have you gone back to your high school to talk to some of your classmates about it? And uh, they said, yeah. And it's been, you know, really surprising to our classmates and those in the years behind us to hear about this because they had no idea. So part of this is a communication challenge. It's just being sure that young people know that, that this, option, this option is out there. Um, the other thing that I like about current technical that doesn't get much attention is the fact it helps keep kids in school. So you know the dropout rates, particularly in our urban schools and some of our rural schools that um, are in relatively low income areas is troubling in terms of you know 50% of the kids, for instance, in many of our urban schools in Ohio, not. Uh, getting through high school. And so the survey is, you know, what would have kept you in school? And the answer is something that was more about the real world. And if you look at the statistics on those who go to career and technical versus those who don't, uh, about 80% of the typical high school student body um, graduates. With CTE, it's more than 90%. And again, the reason is this is a, it's a real world experience. Uh, that they're having. So I think there's a great opportunity here not only to provide that education and provide the great opportunity to our young people, but also to keep kids in school by showing them that they can do something that's really interesting to them that's going to lead to something they can see and visualize. Uh, the legislation I talked about is amending the Perkins Act. Some of you have worked hard with Perkins over the years. We want to ensure Perkins does get reauthorized. We'd like it to work better for CTE. So one, it defines what constitutes a rigorous CTE curriculum. Uh, requiring Perkins Grant recipients to incorporate some key elements in their programs. It also increases flexibility for states and localities to be able to use this Perkins Grant funding to establish uh, CTE-focused programs that do allow students to gain college credit. Uh, we, we like that in Ohio particularly. Uh, it improves the links between high school and post-secondary education to help ease the attainment of industry-recognized credentials, licenses, apprenticeships, post-secondary certificates, again, to be able to obtain jobs in these high-demand fields. Uh, and it promotes partnerships between local businesses, regional industries, and stakeholders in the community to create pathways for students to get those internships, learning service experiences, or apprenticeships as they transition um, into workforce or, or into a post-secondary education. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this legislation can be enacted. It's bipartisan, obviously, with Senator Kane and myself, it should be. Uh, it, it's the kind of legislation I think that would help from the federal level to not just encourage uh, Perkins and, and what it does, but to make it more targeted on making CTE work better for, for those students and for, uh, for, for our economy. I, I, I grew up in a uh, uh, small family business. It was a forklift truck distributor. Um, I worked there. My brother worked there. My brother still works there. My, my sister worked there. And um, 
as in um, a car distribution business, most employees are technicians and uh, mechanics. And you know, th these are people who turn a wrench their whole career, and um, there's a lot of dignity and self-respect that comes with that, and a lot of opportunity right now. And if you talk to the forklift truck distributors in Ohio, they will tell you they have openings, and the openings are not among the salesmen or the administrative people or even the IT people. It's among the technical people, and, and they're looking for them. And we've got to be sure our young people know that, that these jobs not only have great opportunities in terms of you know, being able to make a, a good living right away, but also uh, a lot of dignity in those blue-collar jobs that enables our economy to succeed and, and uh, enables people to achieve their dreams. And that's part of the broader message here that we hope this caucus and the work that you're doing here will encourage. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And I know, uh, again, you're, you're going to hear a lot from some great panelists here. And I appreciate them being here and make, making the track. And, and Chuck, thanks for coming from the Buckeye State. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Portman, and also Senators Kane and Baldwin, who are here. They, as I mentioned, they've all been terrific supporters of this caucus. Uh, Senator Enzi, also, who is the uh, fourth co-chair of the caucus, the bipartisan caucus. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm with the Association for Career and Technical Education. For those that don't know who we are, we're a 501c3 organization that really represents all of the career tech ed practitioners out in the states. Uh, and we work very closely with our state associations as well. Um, we are pleased to be working on this caucus, and I wanted to mention there are a few handouts at the front desk because today's focus is really about the skills gap and that connection between education and business. The handouts that are out there are really related to that topic, so if you're interested in those or you want to come to our website, which is acteonline.org, you can get those as well on the website. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our panelists, although I think our senators already did some of that, and I apologize if we repeat a bit. We are going to then hear from them, uh, I think in the order that I introduced them, and then after that we'll have a little bit of Q&A and take questions and answers from the audience at the end as well. We have plenty of time, so we won't be rushed, uh, but if we, I know the senators, you always have to work with the schedules, as you know, and uh, we thank them for making time today, uh, and we uh, had them at the beginning, so now we'll just go forward with the rest of our program. So first to my immediate left, make sure I get everybody in the right order. We have uh, Charles, or I think you go by Chuck Sp Spielman. Chuck's the superintendent of Tri-Rivers Career Center, and that is the home of the Robotics and Advanced Manufacturing Technology Education Collaborative, which I'm really eager to hear more about because I read about it in his bio. Uh, he is also um, most recently, uh, or I should say the most recently, the Ram Tech Initiative was selected the statewide winner of the 2014 Excellence in Workforce Development Innovation Award by the Ohio Economic Development Association. So there's a big connection right there with business and education. And Mr. Spielman has an extensive career in education and a focus on providing students a competitive advantage as they enter the workplace. He has uh, always said, it says in his bio, that's about getting the right student in the right program for the right reason. And I think that's a terrific uh, way to think of it. To Chuck's uh, left, your right, would be Danny Hunley. And he is the Vice President uh, of Operations at Newport News Shipbuilding out of uh, Newport News, Virginia. Danny is the Vice President of Operations there. Uh, and that is a, sub, or a division of the Huntington Ingalls Industries, which is the largest corporation. Uh, Mr. Hunley is, is responsible for production labor resources and processes, plant engineering and maintenance, waterfront support services, training, instructional design, and the apprenticeship school. So you've got a lot on your plate, it sounds like. Uh, and I know he also attended the apprenticeship school, and he also serves on uh, the Virginia Workforce Council and is a trustee at St. Leo University uh, as well. So he's got a lot of connections to not only business but the education side. Uh, to his left is Brian Albrecht. Dr. Albrecht is president of Gateway Technical College, and he is the chief executive where he oversees the college's 65 academic programs, 15 educational facilities, and a comprehensive $160 million budget and a also a $4 million college foundation. So I 
I know from experience that Mike, uh, Brian has done a terrific job of really forging partnerships with business and industry as he's grown those programs on campus. He is from the Kenosha Racine and Walworth counties area. Uh, and he also, I believe, is on about 50 boards, is that correct, nationally? I don't know how you do it. Uh, and finally, he leads 600 educational professionals and 400 industry advisor committee partners, which are business partners for the most part, I would guess. Finally, last but certainly not least, is Portia Wu, who's the Assistant Secretary of the Employment and Training Administration at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, as the Assistant Secretary of Labor for Employment and Training, Ms. Wu works to advance job-driven job skills training. Previously, she served in the White House as Special Assistant to the President for Labor and Workforce Policy, and she spent seven years handling labor and pension issues for the Senate Health Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. So I guess you're back home in some ways as well, or where you started. So thank you again for all of you being here today. Uh, we're really looking forward to a robust discussion about this connection between business and education. And I'm just going to start off with questions. But as we're going through the questions, feel free. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We're going to first have a little bit of intro from each of them. So I apologize. And Chuck, we'll have you start that off. Well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure and honor to be here. I am Charles Spielman, superintendent at tri Rivers Career Center, the home of the Ream Tech Center. I want to thank all of you who have taken the time to be here today uh, for this important discussion about career and technical education. A special thanks goes out to our senators, Senator Kane, Senator Portman, Senator Baldwin, for this workforce development. Uh, this should not and does not uh, have a party affiliation, uh, and thus I appreciate the bipartisan uh, work on this. Uh, everyone deserves to have a great career, and we need to work together. Uh, one thing I've learned over the last 30 months in our development of our Ramtech Center uh, through the planning and the opening is that manufacturing in Ohio uh, and across the nation is back strong. It's just not back in the same way. Uh, Ramtech Center uh, is the first of its kind in Ohio that we opened up. Uh, and we are, uh, provide industry recognized and certified training in robotics, CNC operation, industrial maintenance, technical trades, on and on and on. Uh, really the bottom line is we provide whatever business and industry needs. Uh, and that should be what education institutions do. Um, and we work hard to support those local industries. We do have about 700 high school students uh, that attend daily. We have about a thousand students we serve um, in the adult short term or certificated track and then we're working closely with Marion Technical College and the Ohio State University regional campus at our site uh, to get this done. This has allowed us to support our manufacturing industries with training that supports their current and future automation needs and goals and we provide dual enrollment opportunities, stackable certificates, other training programs to our business and industry partners. Manufacturing across our nation has gone, undergone a major transformation, and as a result, educational training institutions need to undergo a similar transformation uh, to meet the needs of these manufacturers. We, uh, 30 months ago, quit telling our manufacturings what we provide, and we changed it and said, what do you need? And that was the start of a wonderful partnership and development of some great training programs. And I would ask anyone that has that opportunity to go directly to your manufacturers, go directly to your industries, and ask them directly what it is they need. In 1990, Ohio had 1.1 million uh, manufacturing jobs. In 2012, we only have about 650. But it's a, a leaner, stronger manufacturing uh, group that's out there and manufacturing is alive and well and the, the average pay for these jobs is 25% higher for any other sector with the same types of credentials and certification. So they're high tech, high skilled, high demand and high pay. These lean manufacturing jobs, while fewer, uh, we are uh, uh, trying to meet the need and we don't have enough in the pipeline. Um, Ohio itself had $80, uh, $80 billion in ma manufacturing output last year, um, second to California and Texas in our output. 
Uh, and 95% of all goods manufactured in Ohio are exported, uh, or make up of our exports, 95% are manufactured goods in Ohio. So that, and those are not just exported across state lines, those are around the world, and, and this is that competitive advantage we need to get back to. The criticism we hear many times about our educational institutions is that they're so busy planning in research mode that they don't act quickly enough to business needs. With this project, we set a goal to directly meet business needs and move at the speed of business. Uh, and as you heard last week, Ramtech was named the most innovative economic development program in the state of Ohio for 2014. And now we are uh, replicating this to eight other centers around the state. And so we will have a statewide uh, response. There will be eight other Ramtech centers that will go live sometime next year. Um, uh, that came through a statewide grant uh, through our, what's called our Straight A Foundation, uh, where lottery money was diverted to seek out innovative programs in education. My personal philosophy is different than, and um, as I've kind of wor worked through my career, uh, when most institutions are planning for something, they, they like to study it, compare it, do another study, get a committee together, maybe even do a pilot program. Um, I was reading uh, just recently about an organizational leadership that people were des describing committees. I found this interesting. One described a committee as a cul-de-sac down, cul down which ideas are lured and then quietly strangled. Another said it's a group of the unwilling chosen by the unfit to do the unnecessary. Uh, I was real glad to see this wasn't the Career Tech Committee, it was the Career Tech Caucus, and I, uh, I would encourage that we remain a caucus and not a committee. My hope is that, uh, that we continue to meet the needs and we move at the speed of business to find solutions and accountability that is both flexible to meet the needs of business and each individual state. Here's the challenge we're facing, and I think you've heard about it recently by some of the Senator's comments. In Ohio, nearly 50% of all manufacturing workers are eligible to retire in the next 10 years, most of which in the next five years. My guess is those numbers are similar across the nation, which kind of was bore out by the, com the comments. We need to do, uh, what we need to do is start to honor the skilled trades again, um, and that not as a less than college track, uh, and for students that don't measure up or meet the accountability measures, it needs to be a pathway, an option. Um, we took a, a, from Wisconsin and some of your mobile lab programs are, that are going on around the state, we also developed a mobile lab program to reach out, to build it. We're taking it all the way down to fifth and sixth grade. Um, our, our governor saw fit to give us funding at the seventh and eighth grade level. We're reaching down, we're gonna build the next generation of workers, but we can't wait till they're in high school and they've already picked the track and and everything's moving along. Here's some interesting truths that we found out. Uh, less than 30% of the jobs that are currently posted in Ohio require a four-year degree, uh, and less than 13% require just a high school diploma. So that means nearly 60% of the jobs, the main jobs in the middle require training beyond high school, but not necessarily a, a, a four-year degree. Uh, we don't want to make decisions too early for students, but at the same time, we don't want to track and lock them in to any career path. We want to give them opportunities. Uh, as it was said, we don't need a survey or a committee to study the situation. We don't need a needs analysis. Uh, we just need to pick up and ask businesses what they need. Senator Portman, a uh, uh, year and a half ago, held an economic summit where he called the business and educational leaders from our area uh, together around the state uh, to discuss, and from that summit, we have uh, developed some national contracts and opportunities, and so I want to personally thank him for that, and we're, uh, just for name, we're uh, taking over Whirlpool Corporation in our area, all their apprenticeship programs, and, and there's some great things that came out of Senator Portman's uh, connections that he helped us get. Finding a trained workforce is one of the biggest uh, things companies are looking for when they relocate. Uh, we recently had a large manufacturer in our area said so they would give back their tax abatement if somebody could guarantee them a, a trained workforce. Folks, you know and I know, every state 
Every community is trying to give away free land and dirt and trying to give away tax abatements. No one has a skilled workforce to provide. And why is that? Why isn't that the national crisis? Every economic development person I talk to, they're trying to figure out a way to repackage the same old stuff. The reality is we need a trained workforce. Uh, in our governor's state of state address recently, he asked colleges, the four-year, the two-year, and the higher ed institutions to work together, and that's what we're doing. Here are some concerns I do have. Recently enacted uh, the 150 rule, which is uh, starting to uh, cause problems with students getting uh, financial aid. That was a recently uh, federal rule that changed with some unintended consequences, and we'll talk about that later. Financial aid approval process, the Ohio Department of Education, or U.S. Department of Education, um, the process to get a new course approved for a welding program or something is now up over a year. Um, the minimum 600-hour rule that many talked about that has to be over 600 hours to qualify for financial aid, um, on and on and on. Many of these things are restricting that job growth and opportunity. The Carl Perkins money, we want all students to have access to high uh, quality career and technical education, and we need to develop a pipeline that makes students' parents aware that the pathways exist. Recently found out that one of our large community colleges in the state, 30% of their new enrollees already had a four-year degree. They just didn't have a job skill. We, a lot, I, I'm very happy when students go on to college, but a lot of students are graduating without a skill to get a job. And so one of the things we need to do is, is work on that. They're now back at the community college getting the skill necessary. Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than, than to repair broken men. And we have a lot of broken men and women in our society that don't have the skills necessary to get the jobs that are out there. And we need to start earlier. So thank you for the opportunity. And we look forward to working together to be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. I have a question for you, but I'll wait till we get to the whole group. And Danny, I think you're next. Thank you. Chuck, you make a tough act to follow. <laughs> Maybe I should have started with you. Good morning. Uh, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to spend some time with you today and represent Huntington Ingalls Industries, Newport News Shipbuilding, and The Apprentice School in today's discussion about career and technical education, apprenticeships, and the life-changing opportunities that they provide. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Senator Kane for his invitation to share my thoughts with you today. Senator Kane has been a tireless advocate for the men and women at Newport News Shipbuilding, both as a U.S. Senator and in his previous job when he was our governor. Uh, we are grateful for his support and his interest, and I echo his remarks. I'd also like to thank the other co-chairs, Senator Portman and Senator Baldwin, for sharing their remarks and, and time with us this morning. And I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time out of your busy day to spend some time to better understand our perspective on this important topic. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about the business that I'm in and a little bit about me. Uh, as has been mentioned, my name is Danny Hunley. I'm the Vice President of Operations at Newport News Shipbuilding, which is a part of Huntington Ingalls Industries. Part of my job is providing and preparing a right-sized workforce uh, capable of doing the production and maintenance work necessary to uh, perform the work that we have on our portfolio. I started working in the shipyard as an 18-year-old college dropout turned welder trainee, and I've spent the last 40 years of my career recovering from my slow start. And the apprentice school at Newport News Shipbuilding has played a role in that, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. But first, let me tell you a, a few things about Huntington Ingalls Industries. Huntington Ingalls Industries is a, an American company, a Fortune 500 company, uh, with $6.8 billion in annual revenue and a work backlog of $24 billion. We employ almost 40,000 employees in our facilities in Virginia, in Mississippi, California, Louisiana, Texas, and Colorado. Among those are more than 18,000 craftsmen. We employ more than 5,500 veterans of the armed services of the United States. Many of our employees are third, fourth, and some fifth generation shipbuilders. And we have more than 1,000 what we call master shipbuilders, 
Those are employees that have over 40 years of continuous service with our company. Among those 1,000, I am proud to call myself one. For more than a century, the craftsmen at Huntington Ingalls have designed, built, overhauled, repaired, and refueled ships for the United States Navy, the United States Coast Guard, and World Navies. We are the nation's industrial designer, builder, refueler of nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. We are one of only two companies in America capable of designing and building nuclear-powered submarines. We are a leading provider of major surface combatants, including destroyers, cruisers, high-endurance cutters, and amphibious assault ships for the U.S. and international navies. More than 40 percent of the U.S. Navy's current combatant fleet was built in one of our facilities. And we also provide aftermarket services for a wide array of naval and commercial vessels, including the refueling, defueling, and overhaul of nuclear ships. And we do this in partnership with suppliers from 49 states. We also provide a wide variety of products and services to the commercial power industry and other government customers, including the Department of Energy. And like most companies, we continue to grow in those tangential marketplaces as the opportunities present themselves. As you can see, we do difficult work. Appropriately, our company's slogan is, hard things done right. That goes for our commitment to our people and to our communities, as well as the work that we do. So let me narrow it down to provide some information about Newport News Shipbuilding. As I mentioned earlier, I represent them. This company was founded in 1886 uh, by Collis P. Huntington, hence the name Huntington Ingalls. And since that time, Newport News Shipbuilding has delivered more than 800 ships, ranging from tugboats to nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. Today, we build all of America's nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and half of her submarines. We build the ships that do some of our nation's most important work. Simply put, there's no other place in the world that's capable of doing what we do. And it's my privilege and it's an honor to call myself a Newport News shipbuilder and an alumnus of the Apprentice School at Newport News and to work alongside some of the finest shipbuilders in the world where I can still learn something new and exciting every day. During my 40-year career, the industrial landscape has evolved, and so have the people. In years past, Newport News Shipbuilding regularly performed commercial ship repair jobs, and we built commercial ships. Last year, we performed none of this work. When I began working at the shipyard, every kid had a bicycle, a crude set of tools, and the spirit of MacGyver. Today, I hire shipbuilders with a completely different skill set and a different mindset. In the last five years, I've hired 8,000 of them. When I started welding at the shipyard, we did everything with manual processes. Last year, 80% of our welding was performed with mechanized and automated processes. When I began shipbuilding, we used slide rules, inking pens, vellum to engineer things. Today, the new generation uses computers, even in their watches. Obviously, the times are changing. And our products are becoming more complex. And the production processes are becoming more complex. And the people are becoming, well, maybe we should say more complex as well. You might say that the historical trajectory of society and the increasingly technical skills required for entry-level workers to build our ships haven't been exactly complementary. So we're faced with a choice. We could complain about what's wrong and how hard it is, or we could face up to the facts and do something about it. At HII, we lead our way to success. A big part of that is embracing, training, and preparing our shipbuilders to be successful. As such, we view our extensive portfolio of training programs as investments, not expenses. And at the pinnacle of these investments are our apprentice schools. At our Ingalls shipyard in Mississippi, we've partnered with the Mississippi Community College System, and through block grant allocation, we're able to build a facility that supports both the apprentice program and continuing education for our incumbent workforce. The Haley Reeves Barber Maritimes Trade Academy opened in November of 2013, 
and provide 72,000 square feet of classrooms and laboratories to prepare Ingalls employees to be proficient shipbuilders doing some of our nation's most important work. The shipbuilders there do a remarkable job of preparing journeymen and craftsmen and leaders to perform that work. But as I mentioned earlier, my entire career has been spent in Newport News, Virginia. Among a host of other things, I'm responsible for the apprentice school there. And that's a responsibility that I hold near and dear as the apprentice school has afforded me the life-changing experiences and the opportunities to recover from my slow start. The apprentice school is an excellent example of the power of CTE to prepare workers for highly skilled, in-demand careers through a combination of rigorous academics and foundational real work experiences that can change the course of lives, much as it changed the course of my life. So let me tell you a few things about our apprentice school. The apprentice school at Newport News was officially established in 1919, when Newport News Shipbuilding President and General Manager Homer L. Ferguson authorized the establishment of the school and appointed its first supervisor of training. Today, we are on our eighth director of training, Mr. Everett Jordan, class of 1977, which was a wonderful class, by the way, and he's here with me today. Everett, thanks for, for joining me uh, on our ride up yesterday. While technology has certainly changed during the school's 95-year history, the principles that underpin our approach to developing craftsmen and leaders in the shipbuilding industry have not changed. From the very first day of apprenticeship, apprentices perform structured on-the-job training under the watchful eye of some of America's absolute best craftsmen. Academic classes are held on paid time, and leadership development through extracurricular activities, including intercollegiate athletics, professional societies, and student organizations form vibrant parts of our school. The Apprentice School offers four, five, six, and eight-year tuition-free apprentices in 26 different specialties. 19 of these are in the traditional shipbuilding trades. In addition, we have seven advanced optional programs that in include dimensional control, which some of you may recognize as metrology, marine design, modeling and simulation, nuclear test, production planning, cost estimating, and marine engineering. The mission of the Apprentice School is to contribute to the success of the company by providing a continuous supply of graduates prepared to lead the industry in their chosen field of specialization. To that end, the school focuses on the development of three ships, craftsmanship, scholarship, and leadership. At the core of every apprenticeship is craftsmanship. Much like every U.S. Marine is a rifleman first, every graduate of the apprentice school is a shipbuilder first. All apprentices begin their careers in a craft, and as such, each apprentice follows a specifically designed and pre-approved rotation plan that ensures experience and competence in all relevant aspects of their chosen trade. Those apprentices are evaluated monthly on the quality of their work, the quantity of their work, their safety, their work habits, their initiative, as well as their demonstrated leadership capacities and abilities. As apprentices move through their programs, they advance from helper to lead mechanic, from courageous follower to humble leader, from unskilled and unknowing novices to highly skilled and knowledgeable shipbuilders. The ingredient that makes this process work so well is our full-time staff of apprentice craft instructors, 100% of whom are graduates of the apprentice school and some of the industry's absolute best craftsmen. Regarding accreditation of our programs, 100% of our programs are registered with the Virginia Apprenticeship Council and recognized by the U.S. Department of Labor. They're also accredited by the Accrediting Commission of the Council on Occupational Education, a national accrediting agency headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia and the academic coursework delivered by our instructors is transferable to colleges and universities in our area and beyond. In addition to craftsmanship, scholarship is a foundational element in apprenticeship as well. 100% of the academic courses in our core curriculum are taught by our own faculty. We require that our faculty members hold the same academic credentials as those required in other colleges and universities. We currently have 17 of those academic instructors, all of which have graduate degrees in, dip in disciplines such as mathematics, physics, 
naval architecture, marine engineering, business administration, and English. The school's highly accomplished faculty includes four PhDs and four doctoral candidates today. But in addition to academic preparation, we also seek out faculty that have distinguished experience in their field. For example, our faculty includes a nuclear engineer from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, an accomplished naval architect, one of our own nuclear test engineers, and a faculty member who completed a fellowship at the Office of Naval Research and was a research physicist in a national laboratory. The academic coursework for apprentices is rigorous, broad, and diverse. Apprentices may study courses ranging from basic blueprint reading and electrical theory to differential calculus and thermodynamics. Some of our apprentices finish with journeyman certificates, some with associate's degrees, and some with bachelor's degrees. All are poised to continue their education and, and benefit and draw the connections between the theory that they learned in the classroom and the practical application on a job site. Our academic programs are supported by partners in the local collegiate environment, including Old Dominion University and two local community colleges, Thomas Nelson Community College in Hampton, Virginia, and Tidewater Community College in Virginia Beach, Virginia. All courses taken at the apprentice school transfer to the area of colleges and universities. And articulation agreements with local colleges and universi universities allow for a seamless transition as our students continue their educational opportunities. Leadership is the third core ingredient at Newport News Shipbuilding in our apprentice school. Leadership learned right is learned through increasingly challenging assignments and opportunity. So we create opportunity. We create opportunity through leadership development programs, professional societies, student organizations, and intercollegiate athletics. Our premier leadership development program, program is called Frontline Fast. FAST being an acronym for Foreman Accelerated Skills Training. This program develops high-performing apprentices for frontline supervisors quickly through a clever, blended approach of craft competences, leadership practices, and on-the-job coaching. The program's cohort model and intentional interaction between apprentices and waterfront management give our apprentices the opportunity to learn and practice the vital connections between leadership and project management. Our philosophy is that apprenticeship is a 24-7 experience, so we create opportunities for apprentices to hone their leadership skills in addition to the shipbuilding production environment. Student government, professional societies, community service are all opportunities to develop leadership. So it's important for apprentices to learn that good leaders are not just focused on internal company objectives, but good leaders also contribute to their communities as well. We currently have three student chapters of professional societies, the JCs, the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers, and the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. In fact, ours was the first collegiate chapter of the JCs in America. Additionally, we create the opportunity for student athletes to develop a lasting bias for unselfishness, leadership, discipline, sportsmanship, teamwork, ethical conduct, social responsibility and integrity. Intercollegiate athletics has been part of the apprentice school since its formal beginnings in 1919. Today, the school fields six varsity teams, baseball, football, golf, men's and women's basketball, and wrestling. These are programs equivalent to NCAA Division III level teams, and our conference affiliations include the United States Collegiate Athletic Association, the Atlantic Central Football Conference, and the National Collegiate Wrestling Association. And I'm proud to say that we've held national championships in five of those six sports. As we look ahead, though, changes in technology, changes in society, and changes in business opportunities also create challenges for us, or as I'd prefer to characterize them, they create opportunities. Within the last decade, we've introduced new programs, metrology, nuclear tests, marine engineering, modeling and simulation and programs similar to those. These moves have been made to ensure that we stay ahead of the industry as we advance in a constantly evolving marketplace. Reminding ourselves that our goal is not just to meet the current demands of our customer, but to anticipate and meet the future needs as well. These changes in our incoming workforce not only dictate what and how we teach, but our ability to be competitive. 
The first apprentices used paper, pencils, trigonometry tables, and plumb bobs. I used mimeograph machines, slide rules, and transits. Today's generation uses wireless connectivity, supercomputers, theodolites, and laser trackers. So what will the next generation look like? I wish I knew. But there's one thing that we do know, and we all know this. If we close our eyes and complacently cling to what we have accomplished, we will become as obsolete as those tools that I mentioned that I use. But if we embrace the challenges for the opportunities that truly are there, career and technical education can be a driving force in creating life-changing experience for the next generation of America's workers, just like the apprentice school did for me. In closing, the apprentice school is an educational and a career opportunity unlike any other. To date, our programs have produced more than 10,000 graduates in support of the operational needs of Newport News shipbuilding in our nation. Today, more than 800 of our apprentices push new boundaries of achievement and explore new opportunities in a complex and evolving workplace. Today, more than 44% of our entire production management teams are graduates of our programs. And today, more than 3,000 of my fellow alumni and I are building and maintaining the nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and submarines that will defend our nation and do some of our nation's most important work for years to come. You see, this is not just a rewarding learning experience, but an opportunity to serve our nation in defense of the American way of life. Again, thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to be with you today, and I look forward to us working together to embrace, train, and prepare Americans for success in what lies ahead. Thank you. The quick time check, we're at 12, so I don't want to cut off our last speakers, but we'll probably switch to Q&A earlier. Great, thank you. I'll make my comments uh, a brief, and I just want to, first of all, thank Danny. What a great presentation, and uh, I think we all would admire not only the inspiration that you brought to this uh, panel discussion today, but your respect for the work that you do and the dignity that you bring to the workers of the communities which you serve. So great, great job. Steve, I want to thank you and ACTE for your continued advocacy. And if I could add Kim Green and the State Directors Association as well, uh, 1.2 million students in current technical education. Every day you're working to try to help support their goals and their dreams for their lives. So thank you for that. Um, my name is Brian Albrecht. I serve as the president of Gateway Technical College uh, located in southeast Wisconsin. I um, wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the Honorable Senator Kane, Senator Portman, and of course our own Senator Tammy Baldwin, who has traveled our state uh, on several occasions to take a look at what we can do to support students, uh, young and adults, in the areas of career development. Um, we're fortunate uh, in Wisconsin to have advocacy roles like Senator Baldwin to help remind us of the important role that we all play, no matter what it is, whether it's in corporate America or in our schools. At Gateway, we serve 23,000 students. We're one of 16 technical colleges in the state. Collectively, over 350,000 students attend one of our 16 colleges. Our mission is to prepare an educated and trained workforce for the communities that we serve. Our student body at Gateway is uh, one of the most diverse in the state of Wisconsin, with over 3,760 active students pursuing one or more of 79 short-term certificate programs. I'm going to brief my comments and really concentrate on the Career and Technical Education Opportunity Act on the importance of apprenticeship, industry certifications, and short-term certificate programs. Some of those programs include things such as computer numerical control, one of the most high-demand occupations in our region and in the state of Wisconsin, e-commerce, of course, today's lifeline for American business, programming for manufacturing, certainly at a time when manufacturing is so important, um, you'd think we would have more attention focused on it. Certified nursing assistants, programmer analysis, graphic communications are just a few of the 79 programs that are qualified under short-term certificate programs at our college. Providing access to education has been at the core of our efforts, and today nearly 56% of our students are eligible for some sort of federal financial aid. While this does serve the degree-seeking students well, it only provides a financial bridge for a portion of the 23,000 students that are attending our college. As you know, short-term certificate programs are not recognized under Title IV of the Higher Education Act for students' financial aid, primarily because of the length of the time that it takes to master the knowledge and skills to succeed in a career path aligned with that certificate. This strategy works opposite of what is needed to spur local economies and build the next generation of skilled workers. Today's workforce is a competency-driven market. Skills are what employers are asking for and what they are willing to pay for. Programs like Certified Nursing Assistant, a gateway into a professional nursing career is not eligible for financial support. Emergency medical technicians, our community's frontline paramedics and first responders, are also not eligible for financial support. 
Even though it leads to state licensure in a career, it does not count because it's five credits and it takes six credits to meet the threshold of financial aid. To give you an idea what this costs, annually in Wisconsin, a five credit EMT course will cost $766. Books are another $150. State licensing test is $75 for the written exam, $115 for the practical exam. If you total it all up, it's in excess of $1,100. So that means that the student would have to come up with that first before they could even enter into that profession. In some ways, locking many students out of pursuing their dream and providing opportunities not like other students. Firefighter One certification has a similar story. In Wisconsin, firefighter licensure is a prerequisite for a job in the fire service industry. In Wisconsin, it's a required course. It's non-credit, therefore not financial aidable. Firefighters, paramedics, nurses, child care professionals are all examples of honorable careers because of Title IV regulations put students in a difficult position, having to pay for their training up front or be shut out pursuing their career and their dream. Post-secondary short-term certificate programs directly aligned with the needs of local economies have some of the highest job placement rates in the country. One group of students in all of higher education that has the best opportunity to repay any financial aid are the ones that are not eligible to receive it. Aligning our nation's investment in education and training is critical to industry recognition of student achievement. Gateway is a member of a voluntary network of 200 community colleges called the National Coalition of Certification Centers. Our common training agenda is to provide students with nationally recognized industry certifications provided by global companies like Snap-on Incorporated and Train. Short-term certificates, industry-endorsed certifications, and apprenticeship training programs are the front door opportunities in the job market. My last example is a program that we've developed in partnership with our area workforce development centers, local businesses. It's called the Gateway Boot Camp Certification Program. This is in the area of computer numerical control and boasts a 95% job placement rate, offers six industry certifications, 100% employer satisfaction, and all aspects of our community support. The boot camp program is a non-credit program provided for, provided for low-income students and an opportunity for a high-skilled career. Unfortunately, it does not qualify for federal financial aid. Changing the economic conditions of communities starts with investing in its citizens. This program is worth our investment. It would be a wise use of federal student financial aid funding. Our story at Gateway is not unique. Community and technical college and career sustaining certificate courses throughout this country deserve our respect and investment. The Career and Technical Education Opportunity Act provides an opportunity to build America's workforce. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today and I look forward to any of the questions that we might be presented. Thank you, Brian. Hi everyone, I'm Portia Wu uh, with the Department of Labor, um, Employment and Training Administration. Uh, I know, I know it's your briefing, Steve, but I, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions uh, to see who's out in the audience. Um, how many of you are Hill staff? Raise your hand. I'll say a lot of Hill staff, so policy decision makers. How many are you uh, people who advise Hill staff from outside organizations about career and technical ed? A lot of people here, too. How many people in this room themselves have gone through a career or technical education, or we think of as CTE? So I think that's really telling and also an important uh, indicator of why the work of this caucus is so incredibly important and um, that these briefings are absolutely vital. So I'm, I'm honored to be here today. I thank the senators and their staffs for inviting me to participate. And I also thank my fellow panelists. I certainly have heard uh, for many years about the fantastic work that all of you are doing from different uh, corners um, of, of our skills and training world. So I'm here from ETA, and of course, um, technically speaking, uh, we don't have career and technical education. That is in the Department of Education, but that's really, if you think about it sort of narrowly as a, you know, the way authorizers and people on the Hill think about it. When you think about it the way people in the world think about it, which is how can we get skills for people so they can get good jobs, that is the business of ETA, and we have uh, major investments in that in this country and in fact, I was recently, uh, I've been doing a lot of forums because of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which we're very delighted that Congress has passed. Um, and I was asked if, it was actually the Great Lakes region, so a lot of you folks belong to that region. Um, I was asked if you could have one wish for how you could improve workforce in this country and have that be granted, what would it be? And I said to increase and improve our investments in career and technical ed. I think this, is, this work and the work people here in the room are interested in is absolutely the linchpin 
to making a difference and addressing the skills needs that we have in this country and the skills mismatches. As Senator Portman said, we are, I mean, it's a fabulous time right now. We have had month upon month of growth. We have growth in skilled jobs and occupations, but we hear over and over again from employers, we cannot find the skilled workers we need. And we have, um, although unemployment is decreasing, we still have too many workers in this country who are unable to find good jobs and who are unable to get a path um, on an on-ramp to the middle class. And, and particularly, I think we have a lot of folks who are being left behind. So as our economy continues to grow, we want to be sure that everyone's skills can be brought to the table to help business grow and meet their needs. I'll just take a couple minutes to talk about some of the things that we're doing at ETA. Again, as I said, we feel very fortunate to have uh, the new Opportunity Act as a springboard, and it really enforces a lot of the um, uh, important priorities that the panelists have mentioned. I also should say that the Vice President's review earlier this year of federal job training investments, not just at Department of Education and Department of Labor, but across the federal government, really sets a lot of the same directions that these panelists have talked about and that we all know make a tremendous difference in terms of making um, federal investments more job driven. That really means making sure they're meeting uh, the workforce needs of our nation's employers. Some key strategies that we're focusing on and that the new legislation really provides the opportunity to make sure that people at the state and local level are focusing on include sector strategies, really diving in on industry partnerships, not just on a local level, but also on a regional level because economies often aren't in one city, they're throughout a region. Sometimes a region bridges a couple of states. And so making sure that we're working with businesses across that region to form strong partnerships and provide good training. Career pathways. I think we all recognize that um, our economy is changing. We don't know what the industries of five years from now are going to be and what the growth industries are going to be. So making sure that individuals can get skills um, with recognized credentials, as others have highlighted, but that also that's, uh, you know, getting skills and training isn't something you do for this six months or these two years. It's a pathway that you can jump on and off of and continue to work your way through throughout a career. And I think that's something um, that we're seeing that many American workers feel that they lack. They feel that they lack access to those good opportunities. They may be working. They may be working two or three jobs, in fact. But what they would like is a, a skilled opportunity and be able to be able to increase those skills throughout their career and their lives. Registered apprenticeship um, is, a, is a great opportunity. I was so delighted to hear so much about um, the wonderful apprenticeship program at Huntington Ingalls. Um, the, the president has issued a challenge for us to double the number of registered apprentices in this country in the next few years. Uh, we are rising to that challenge. The Department of Labor will be issuing a solicitation for grants in a couple of months this fall um, for modernized apprenticeships. And I think this is absolutely key. The building and construction trades have many apprenticeship models. They're very successful. We all know about them and want to continue to invest in them. We hope that other industries will also learn from these models and adopt them. A lot of skilled industries across, uh, maybe in arenas you haven't thought of, in technology, in healthcare, um, and in advanced manufacturing. We'd like to see the mod model of apprenticeship spread further. And this, this also ties in more broadly with work-based learning. I think we all understand that for a lot of people, learning is more exciting if you have a hands-on aspect. And it's even more exciting if you're making money while you're doing it. So building in different kinds of work-based learning, obviously that's a huge amount of what we're going to be focusing on under the Innovation and Opportunity Act. But it's also a successful strategy that we want to encourage generally. We think there's a lot of flexibility in the new law to do that. We welcome the opportunity to work with employers on and uh, local workforce and educational entities on those partnerships and opportunities. So I'll just close by saying that, um, as I mentioned, and I see Scott from Senator Murray's office in the back uh, there who worked on this legislation for many years. Um, we're grateful to Congress to have the opportunity to implement this law. We will be drafting the regulations. Our draft regs are due in January. So in terms of advancing these priorities, we want to be sure that we're meeting your needs and your concerns and helping to um, bring forward these successful practices. We have uh, a lot of webinars and open forums. We, we welcome your feedback about what sorts of guidance we could provide. I know a lot of um, our panelists have talked about funding 
and the restrictions on educational funding, I can't address those because they're not within DOL, but I will say that a lot of the funding of these types of education comes through the workforce system. Because higher education funding can't pay for it, that's how a lot of it is paid for. If it's not paid for by individuals, we do it through our individual training accounts. We do it through the local workforce system. So we want to make sure those investments are effective and doing the best that they can, and we welcome your feedback on how best to do that. Thank you. Well, thanks, Portia, and thanks, everyone. Uh, Portia, something you just mentioned was the cooperation between the Department of Labor, Department of Education, and other ed federal agencies, which uh, I know I'm very encouraged by. We were at a meeting last week with the Assistant Secretary at OCTE, Career, Tech, Career Adult and Technical Education, and I think uh, that that's very encouraging and something that's going to be needed as we move forward. I want to focus more on the skills gap issue, though. Um, Chuck, you brought up, uh, you mentioned something in your comments about the, that in Ohio, I think you had dropped from around a million jobs to 250,000 in, manu was it manufacturing? It was from 1.1 million manufacturing jobs to 650,000. To 650, so about right. half. And I'm, what, what that sparks in my mind is the, the issue of skills need and how we better connect the education with what's needed in the field. So I want everybody to kind of answer that question, how do you grapple with, how do you address in the education level to better meet the needs of business and industry? Uh, and I'm sure others uh, have answers to that as well. Well, I, I am, um, both my parents were factory workers growing up, and uh, as those factory jobs were lost, my parents had to transition to other careers. My dad became a real estate agent. I uh, went back at night school, got some training, my, and my mother became a cosmetologist and opened her own um, uh, beauty salon in town. Uh, but parents remember that. They remember the downsizing, and the offshoring of jobs. And they were, did not encourage their kids to go into these type of manufacturing jobs. They were seen as dangerous, dirty, uh, unskilled. Uh, and so a lot of parents got the message. Uh, let's send our students to college. Uh, the problem is, if you look at the college attainment, last year, record number, 67% of students enrolled in college uh, within six months upon graduating from high school. But only 25% are going to graduate. Those numbers should shock us into making changes. And what's happened is they get in, they start getting debt, and they come out without a skill and without hope. And when you don't have the hope and you don't have the skill, life tends to spiral down. And it has spiraled down in our community, which is undergoing a lot of change. We were a proud manufacturing community, and now we've been asked to change. And so change we are, you know, and we have. Um, and we're bringing these high-skilled opportunities back. Uh, we're getting kids enrolled. And we're saying to businesses, no longer do you get to have 20 students to pick from for one job. We're lining businesses up and saying, look, you need to partner with us uh, to give a student a career opportunity. So we're, we're working hard at that, uh, but it's re-educating uh, our parents, and, and quite honestly, when we looked at it locally, um, our mothers were a big influence in our students in their, 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 those middle school years, making decisions, talking to them about going to college. Many of these careers we need to start talking about not a less than college track, because the new STEM uh, opportunities that are out there, most of the STEM jobs don't require a four-year degree. Uh, some refer to them as gray STEM, you know, kind of in between the white and the blue collar. And the reality is those are high-paying, high-skilled jobs. And we need to talk about that. We need to enforce it. And we need to provide the certifications necessary uh, for those jobs. And part of that is just, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about today, we really need to talk about we need better informed career counselors that, don't, uh, that aren't just trained on how to write good college resume help, you know, or uh, letters. Uh, they need to actually know what's available in the local workforce and how they can be uh, gearing students, looking at their unique skills and abilities to some of these careers. So I think it's all hands on deck. Uh, businesses don't get to choose from, you know, uh, you know 20 uh, workers for every job. Educators need to start to change what we do and no longer say this is all, it's a one size fits all. You know, and, and you know, locally, uh, I will say in our state, our, uh, Governor Kasich has taken this on as a challenge. 
Um, he has re revitalized the way Board of Regents does business, the way we do business across the state. And uh, now it takes only one week for me to get a program, new program approved through my Ohio Board of Regents, but we still take a year to a year and a half to get financial aid approved for a course. And businesses, they don't have a year and a half to wait. Their needs now. Right. And so uh, there needs to be some uh, flexibility in some of these regulations to do this. Thank you. Anybody else about that education business connection and how we really get to the meat of what's needed by employers? Yeah, well, I, I think it just, it, I mean, you've got to open up the conversation. We're fortunate to have a community that's um, eager to listen to how they can help support educational programs. So the business partnerships that we've established are, are core to not only what's important for Gateway, but they're, impor they're equally important for that local business. So we try to identify that common denominator. And there are many programs that help to create that conversation that communities are embracing. I'm sure you've all heard of Dream It, Do It before. That's a, a great avenue to help create the conversation of uh, how we can work with schools. But Project Lead the Way, First Robotics, uh, the STEM education was mentioned. There's a lot of different ways to bring that conversation to light. But everyone's struggling with the same concern is that how do we prepare a qualified and skilled workforce? And it starts with first understanding your community and then understanding what you can do within your community to help develop that workforce. So, you know, we try to develop everything around the concept of establishing a partnership, shared responsibility. And Steve, if I might, I think that's where, um, when I think of workforce system, I, of course, in my mind, include career and technical and adult ed and, and four years as well. But, but you know, the traditional workforce system, in, in other words, the workforce boards, really do have an important role to play in this partnership of providing that information. Because any individual employer can come forward and say, I need this. But the role, and I hope under the new law, this will be even more of a strategic and projecting role of the workforce boards working with state economic development agencies, as well as education and, and workforce and commerce, is to really understand what's coming. Right? And what do we see across 50 employers or 100 employers in our region? And what do we see today, two years from now, five years from now, to help everyone um, and work with educational institutions to project so they can plan? Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the clock, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to switch to the audience because I don't want you to leave and have a burning question you didn't get to hear an answer to. So anybody out there have a question? Yes. Thank you for that question. That's a very good one, by the way. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that differentiates uh, great from just good. Uh, the great businesses in America anticipate what the customer's going to need, and they provide those goods and services before the customer asks for them. I believe it was Henry Ford that said when he surveyed his customers, they said they wanted faster horses. But he saw beyond that and created a, an answer to the problem that they didn't know that they had yet. Uh, that's much of the challenge that we have. Uh, our approach to that is maintaining our, uh, true to our core principles of craftsmanship, scholarship, and leadership, and that every, every apprentice is a shipbuilder first so that regardless of the job that they have, they understand uh, how the product is built. Um, scholarship in that uh, they learn that they have academic preparation to prepare them to think broader and longer than just the job that they'll have next. And most importantly, leadership, uh, where they learn to, to lead and think like leaders, uh, not like followers, but to think in creative, uh, entrepreneurial, and innovative ways, to see ahead, to, to create an institutional intelligence where you can map together the unknown parts into a, a picture that's not yet seen. Uh, those things change. Uh, and looking back over my career, as radical as they may seem, they're, they're pretty evolutionary, and, and you can see them coming. But you have to be alert to them and react to them quickly. Uh, as has been mentioned on both sides of the panel, uh, they have, you have to be able to be flexible enough and reactive enough not to get caught behind the curve and end up spending a lot of time playing catch-up. So thank you for that question. I hope that, that helped. 
The only thing I would add to that, we found out locally, whether it's CNC operation, you can't become an outstanding CNC operator until you understand the process of milling, metal lathe, work, understanding the hand tool. You can't become probably a, a master uh, robotic welder until you really understand how to weld and so that if the process isn't working, what is the problem in the process? So part of it is the beginning skills. The technologies are always gonna change. Those foundational skills, a lot of them don't change. And so one of the things is we're talking about the skilled trade, it's those foundational skills. We've taken them in Ohio out of all of our schools. The only, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, traditional metal classes and, and wood classes that I had in a comprehensive high school that I attended no longer exist. And the only way you can get those is to go to the vocational or the career and technical center. And I think it's a mistake. And so one of the things we're trying to do is push that out. So, you know, those foundational skills are critical. We need to start them at a young age. And then, and then guess what? I think our business and industry is always going to be keeping up with the technology that's critical. So I hear scholarship, which to me sounds like maybe academics or critical thinking skills, some of those things we hear a lot in the the national discussion about what's needed, and also technical skills. It sounds like a foundational technical yeah. basis as well. Great. Other questions? We probably have time for another one or two. Yes, sir. I can maybe start with that. I'm sure everybody has some great examples, but um, just to give you a, a couple of ideas, we work with SC Johnson Corporation, uh, so world leader in manufacturing. Um, they sponsor our boot camp programs, and they helped us put together what's called the SC Johnson Integrated Manufacturing Center. So we're working on curriculum, we're working on third-party assessments, we're working on evaluation of the success of employment rates of those individuals. With Snap-on Incorporated, another world-leading uh, company, we've developed in partnership their diagnostic certification program. We now have 19 different certifications that we implement for Snap-on. We train colleges across America. That's the National Coalition of Certification Centers. 16,000 technicians were certified last year based on Snap-on standards. We run Train Corporation's Automated Building Systems Certification. Same scenario, we train colleges around the country in automated building systems, endorsed by Train, developed by in partnership with Train content and curriculum. Um, in Syncurator, we have a, a lab inside of their uh, plant. We teach basic math blueprint reading to their incumbent workforce. We run the apprenticeship program for Ocean Spray. There's over 400 different training agreements that we have. So they're all unique and different, but they are designed specifically to address the skills gaps that they have in some ways, and also in ways to develop a broader base for the talent pipeline to get young people interested in working for their companies which are located in our communities. I will add a little bit what we did at Tri-Rivers. Uh, eight years ago, I came to Tri-Rivers, and as I walked around, we still were training on equipment and programs that were no longer placing students in, into uh, good careers. And so we made a change. We went from 26 programs down to 16. We're back up to 18 programs. So we eliminated the programs that weren't placing students in, in real jobs, uh, and we updated our programs. Business, they had a hand in this. They were donating to get a tax write-off, old obsolete equipment they were no longer using, and we were putting those in and training on them. I will no longer do that. Uh, I will take the equipment and I turn around if it's metal and scrap it, and I buy the real equipment that they're using. So one of the things, I have a couple individuals here from my school. We go out into the business and industry and see what they're training on, see what they're doing, ask the questions, talk to the plant managers, and that's where we get the information. So we tour all of our local factories, our, our businesses. We, we, we don't want to pat on the back. We don't want to be told everything's fine. By That sometimes happens at your local chambers and this or that. We want to hear from the people that are struggling out there, that are, that are hiring our students, that are placing our students, that are looking for new talent. What is it you need? And so we're trying to react to that. And I'll be honest with you, that's different. That's a different process for us. And for the last five years, uh, that journey has paid uh, great dividends for us locally. Talk in, um, I was just wondering, oh, go ahead, Danny, I'm sorry. 
I was just going to add a bit to that. Uh, when we ask ourselves, why is it so hard to do the things that you're asking about? Why is it so difficult for educators and employers to come together and predict what each other need? Uh, I think at the root of that is the fact that the construct within which we operate says we have educators and we have employers and never the two shall meet, right? We should have environments and we should create environments where educators and employers act in partnership. And in my experience, where that works best is the way I find the best programs. So the question then becomes, how do you create those partnerships between educators and, and uh, employers? Uh, we take a couple of approaches. One is we're very active in supporting our local school systems. I create jobs for about 200 teachers in the local area that we employ for the summer. Instead of them having the summer off, we give them uh, pro give them production work in our shipyard. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is to tear down some of the mystique about the old legends of the old shipyards of the 50 years ago, you know, with the billowing chimneys and all of those things. So they can come in and really see the technology and hear the buzz and excitement and the voice of those students that they may have just taught a few years ago to see that the shipyard of old isn't the shipyard of new. But more importantly, is to allow them to go back into their classrooms and into their schools and be able to talk firsthand about the skill sets that are really necessary to have gainful employment. And some of those aren't, uh, you don't have to be a nuclear physicist, but you do have to be able to read, you have to be able to write, you have to be able to communicate, and you have to have those skills that uh, many of us refer to as soft skills. I'd tell you in, that's, a, that's a discredit to the, to the skill. Those are really hard skills. Those are things that every person needs in order to be employable. And we find that they're absent whether these people are coming right out of high school, high school dropouts, or college graduates. Some of those em employment skills are missing. So they can go back then and, and teach that. The other thing that we do is we embed ourselves, guys like me and Mr. Jordan, we sit on a number of boards of colleges and universities so we can make that bridge. And, and that partnership really is a full contact sport, and you can't mine it on a spreadsheet. You can't go into a, a database and mine out the local relationships that need to exist. Because workforce development and training, whether it's the trainee or the employer, all tend to be either local or regional issues that have local and regional solutions. And those work best when the employers and the educators are working together as teammates and as really in the partnership model. So that's our approach to that. Thanks. Great. Brian, did you have something to add? No, no. I, I think I think he's absolutely right. You know, it's, you've got to uh, take time to go out and learn about your community and spend time talking with the, the leaders in your community, whether it's the government, workforce development, whether it's corporate industry, um, or your schools. And it takes all of us to become champions. And that's exactly what this whole caucus is about: is trying to elevate people's awareness and involvement. Great. Well, I have us at 12:30, so I want to thank everyone for attending. I also want to thank the staff of the senators who work on this caucus because I know they probably do the yeoman's work on this. And I want to thank, finally, uh, last but not least, our panelists. Please join me. And that's it. Stay tuned for future caucus events.